traveling right now. I'm introducing um, Dr. Amendola. I always said her name. <laughs> I, we've written a proposal. She's um, led a, propo a nice proposal for the last few years on, on her work in corrosion, and uh, I was lucky to be part of that. But um, she's, uh, she's in the mechanical engineering program at Montana State University. Um, she was a research scientist. Well, I'm going to go back to her, I guess, her, her education. She has a, a Master of Science in Chemical Engineering in 2006, University of Genoa, Italy. Um, PhD in Material Science and Technology 2010. And then um, in uh, March 2010, she, she was at the CNR Research, uh, National Research Council in Italy as a research scientist. And then went from there to um, MSU as a postdoc, mm -hmm. 2011 to 2012. Yeah. And then she was a research scientist in chemical engineering for um, half a year, and then she became a faculty member um, in 2013 with mechanical engineering. Yes, correct. And then she teaches uh, the sophomore level materials class and another materials class. She says this class is really big right now. She says a couple other students or more. Yes. Um, so her, her research interests are focused on fundamental and applied research in materials degradation, um, durability in extreme environments for energy, power, propulsion. Um, and she has current research interests including oxidation, corrosion of metallic alloys, high temp protective coatings, um, and then high temperature corrosive ga gases and water vapor interactions with metal and ceramics. So she, uh, she's, uh, you know, we've been working together, I guess, for a few years. Hopefully we'll get some, some yeah. funding kind of ironed out. And uh, we're really happy to have her here. So she's going to share some of her research. Um, I guess, is this over, what span is this research you're going to cover? This will cover some of the results for solid oxide fuel cells, a metallic material for solid oxide fuel cells, and then we'll move to ceramic materials for solid oxide fuel cells, and a little bit of that uh, uh, research proposal awesome. that we have together. So yeah. One more Thank you. Thank you, and thanks you for coming. Um, so my name is Roberta Amendola, as Jack just introduced me. Some few words about me. I will be using this screen just because I'm right-handed. So that's where I come from. I come from Italy, and I come from this town that is called Genoa. Curious fact, when we moved to the United States, one of the very first things that people was telling us is, oh, Genoa, like the salami which was kind of weird uh, because in Genoa we don't really have uh, that kind of salami. We do have a Genoa salami, but it comes from a town that has probably 500 people, so it was kind of really confusing to me. But then I tried the Genoa salami and discovered that uh, in Italy that is Milan salami. <laughs> so a lot of confusion. Anyway, no Genoa salami. Doesn't exist. <laughs> so. About me, I'm a mom, I have a four-year-old and a husband. If you are a Star Wars fan, just please check on the t-shirt. And when I'm not teaching or doing research, I love to go horseback riding, which actually is what brought me to Montana, uh, because I really do love horses. I own a horse for 11 years when I was there. So that's just a little bit about me and who I am as a person. So let's talk about uh, what I do when it comes to research. So I do study materials in extreme environment. So if you check on the web or you go to Wikipedia and you look for materials in extreme environment or the definition in general of extreme environment, what you will find is a high temperature and high pressure. Actually, I do some of research on that, as you can see here, high temperature. But uh, when it comes to material, we can define extreme environment, anything that brings the material really to its limit. So what I do is essentially try to reproduce those extreme conditions and understand our specific material characteristics from the composition to what we call the microstructure, or better, how the material is built at the microscopic level and understand the connection and how the materials will react to the environment. So what I study most of the time is the effect of high temperature itself or high temperature and the corrosive gases. Presence of stresses, which can be an additional factor on top of the high temperature of the corrosive gases. 
And uh, very recently, I started researching uh, biocorrosion, which is another extreme environment because it exposes material to very low content of oxygen, hazardous liquids like uh, um, sulfur, base liquids and the effect of microorganisms, so a pretty nasty environment. So today I will share with you some of the results that I had from renewable energy sources research like solid oxide fuel cells and some that had NASA funding that will deal with the propulsion. So solid oxide fuel cells, that's what that SOFC stand for. So solid oxide fuel cell, if you're not familiar with what a fuel cell is, fuel cell is a very promising renewable energy device and it's promising because it is fuel flexible and the byproduct that you will get from a fuel cell is, is essentially water. Solid oxide fuel cell are a specific kind that have a very high um, productivity very high power output compared to other, to other cells. Uh, they work with the solid materials that are ceramic in nature, um, but they do require high temperature for the activation of these specific ceramic materials. If you're not familiar with what a fuel cell is, essentially you can compare a fuel cell to a normal battery that uh, you are used to, to use in any uh, of your electronic device, like this pointer has a two uh, AAA batteries. So essentially the concept is the same. So you are producing your power through an electrochemical process instead of a combustion process, which is what uh, we do with our uh, car engine, for example. So a solid oxide fuel cell, like any other battery, is made out of a cathode, which is the plus side of our battery, and electrolyte, which is what allows for the chemical reaction inside the battery, and an anode, which is the minus side. If we consider this assembly, only these three layers, the power output it will be really, really low. It's about the one tenth of what you will get out of a, of a standard battery that you're using. So to reach an output that is actually useful for some kind of application and have enough electrical energy, you need to build a physical stack of this unit. You will do that with an additional element that is called the interconnect that you can see right there. So you have a one stack, which is your fuel cell, on top of that, you will put an interconnect, and on top of the interconnect, you will put another fuel cell stack. Uh, sorry, fuel cell unit. So as you can see here, the interconnect will be in contact with the cathode, the plus side on one side, and the anode on the other side. So when it comes to fuel cell, what happens is that uh, you have uh, to feed some gas into the system to allow the chemical reaction to happen. What you do for a fuel cell, for this kind of fuel cell, is that you will flow some kind of uh, hydrogen producing gas. It can be pure hydrogen or it can be some gas that will have hydrogen like uh, CH4, so like uh, methane or some alcohol. And on the other side, at the cathode, at the positive side, most of the time you will use air and oxygen will be responsible for the chemical reaction. There is a lot of fuel flexibility in this unit, so you can use the best case scenario that will produce just the water, will be using hydrogen, while if you're using uh, something that has a carbon in the molecule, you will have CO2 as a byproduct too. So the problem with the, the our interconnect is that uh, the environment is really specific and very harsh. The fuel cell will work at a temperature that is in between 600 and 800 degrees. Due to specific material properties, 600 degrees is still a too low of a temperature to activate the full properties of the material. So most of the time, the fuel cell will work at 800 degrees. Good, degrees. Good progress has been made at 700 degrees with this kind of material that are used for the ceramic materials. 
So with the interconnect, uh, since as you have seen is in contact on one side uh, with the plus, so the cathode, and on the other side uh, with the minus, which is the anode, what will happen is that our material, that I will tell you more about, uh, is exposed on one side uh, to very oxidant condition with oxygen flowing, and on the other side, on the minus side, uh, it will be uh, exposed to a reducing environment with hydrogen. So it is a very, very specific. On top of that, uh, you will have the two electrodes. So the anode, the ceramic uh, anode material, where you have the hydrogen, and the cathode material, steel ceramic, where you have the oxygen. Now, to resist to this specific environment uh, and uh, the high temperature, the very first material that were selected were ceramic materials. The other thing that this, the interconnect request is that it puts in contact the two units of the fuel cell. But the problem is that we are producing power. So whatever material we are selecting, it must be electrically conductive. So the very first material that were selected were ceramic materials. But the problem with ceramic material is that, yes, they, offer, they were offering a good conductivity, but they were very hard to manufacture, and uh, they were activated at much higher temperatures. So some other materials have been considered to replace the expensive ceramic materials, because the, the, the ultimate target of a solid oxide fuel cell is to have them on the market as soon as possible as uh, renewable energy sources. So the selection of the material has been moved to, to stainless steels. Stainless steels uh, can have a different structure depending uh, on what their microstructure is. We are interested in something that is electrically conductive. In the ferritic stainless steel, this is what FSS stands for, ferritic stainless steel, uh, we're the best uh, candidate. When it comes to ferritic stainless steel, uh, they must have a specific, uh, specific characteristics. They must have a specific amount of uh, chromium in the composition. Why is that? Because at high temperature, the ferritic stainless steel uh, will protect itself, uh, forming uh, a coating on top, uh, which is completely natural, which is a chromia, which is a chromium oxide coating uh, that is electrically conductive at the operating temperature of the solid oxide fuel cells. The minimum content of a chromium to have this kind of effect, so to allow for the formation of the chromium oxide on top of the ferritic stainless steel is a 17%, which is very high. The ideal content in the formulation of the material is 20 to 24%. So we may have solved a lot of our issues if we consider that amount of chromium in the ferritic stainless steel. So they can resist, in theory, the material can resist for a long time to this specific exposure. Actually, it doesn't happen. The downside of adding too much chromium in the formulation of the material is that at this specific high temperature and condition, volatile species will be produced and what will happen to the volatile species is that there will be a deposition in the cathode material, so they will migrate from the metals to the cathode, to the plus side, and they will decrease the efficiency of the cathode material. This phenomenon is called the chromium poisoning. So my research is about trying to optimize the characteristics of this ferritic stainless steel with the goal of um, keeping the, the chromium vaporization low and increasing the lifetime of the ferritic stainless steel. The Department of Energy has a set a goal as a lifetime of the ferritic stainless steel that corresponds to 40,000 hours. That is about 4.5 years, four years and a half. Yes? What's the cathode made out of? Can you make it just something that just doesn't like chromium? No, it's really hard. The current cathode material is called LSM, which is a lanthanum strontium manganite. 
Um, the problem is that, uh, yes, you can change the composition of the cathode to something that is uh, slightly less uh, sensitive to the presence of chromium, but the problem is that you are already starting with a material that has a low electrical conductivity and doesn't allow for the catalytic reaction of the whole fuel cell. Uh, there is a lot of research out there to find uh, something that is, uh, um, could work, but it looks that uh, an easier way to solve the problem would be to decrease the vaporization from the interconnect material. Um, so, so far we are pretty far away from this goal. The longest time that a solid oxide fuel cell has been working has been 2,000 hours. So that's very low compared to that 40,000 hours. So there is a lot of research going on to optimize the material and the um, optimization of uh, the materials that are used for the fuel cell. So these are the most important characteristics that the interconnect must have. It must be hermetic because as I was telling you before, on one side we have hydrogen and on the other side we have oxygen. So when hydrogen and oxygen will get together, they will have an explosive reaction that will form water. So that's something that we want to avoid. So the whole system must be sealed. They must be chemically stable and electrically stable. Chemically stable will mean that it should not react with the other component of the fuel cell. So we must try to avoid something like poisoning as much as possible. Electrically stable means that in the longer term, the power output has to be constant. So we want to have that high power output. And if we want something on the market which is fast, it must be inexpensive. Another huge advantage of ferritic stainless steel is that they are very easy to machine and they're easily available. So, my research was about uh, trying to expose a ferritic stainless steel, and uh, the material selected was called AZ441, to the actual dual atmosphere condition. So when you are building your stack, to activate the reaction in the startup of the fuel cell, you need to feed in on top of the gases, electrical and electrical flow to the system to allow for the reactions to happen. So there has been a lot of research going on about what will be happening to the materials when exposed to this specific environment. However, there was almost no research about the effect of the electrical current that you use on your, on your fuel cell to make it work. So the whole process is electrochemical, and there are a lot of uh, diffusing species from one side to the others. So it's kind of a natural question if adding on top of the condition electrical current will change something or not. It was actually an open debate. So what we did, and this, pro this uh, research was in international collaboration with Italy and uh, Taiwan, what we did was to expose the interconnect to condition that reproduce the fuel cell without electrical, um, elect, uh, contacting electrodes. So this is your sample, your stainless steel. Those are two gold electrodes to allow for the electrical contact. And then on one side, there was air. And on the other side, hydrogen. 3% moist, which is the condition that most likely will be used in the fuel cell. What you're looking at right here is a protective coating that we have been using on top of the ferritic stainless steel. So when it comes to manufacturing material that is able to resist to high temperature, you have two possible solutions. You can get to the condition of the material producing something on itself, so self-protecting itself, using something that is already in the composition, like the ferritic stainless steel that produced the chromium oxide to protect the bulk of the material from further oxidation, or you can use a coating on top of the material. 
essentially you're putting something on your material that will be protective. In this case, we were using nickel. And in particular, we were using a process for the position that is called electroless uh, uh, plating. What we wanted to achieve was a good electrical conductivity and a lower chromium vaporization. Or better, not lower chromium vaporization, but we wanted to avoid the chromium to reach the outer surface of the material where the contacted cathode will be. So what you're looking at here is what is called a micrograph, meaning a picture under the microscope of the material of the surface of our sample with nickel. And in here, you can see what is called the cross section. Essentially, you slice your material and you look at the slice under your microscope. So what you can see here in this dark gray color is the stainless steel AZ441. And this layer on top here is the pure nickel that was deposited on top. This graph that you can see here, uh, that is what is called the needy S cross section. And it gives you the composition of those layer so you can see that this signal corresponds uh, to the nickel, and then when we move to the, where the steel is, there is no signal for nickel. While this is the main component of the steel, which is the iron, that reaches the layer of nickel, and then it decreases. So this is where we started. So the AZ441 was selected because it is a very uh, easy to find on the market and uh, it is really cheap compared to other specific materials or so other specific alloys that have been manufactured for solid oxide fuel cells applications. The amount of chromium is about 18%. In this specific case, it was a 17.83. 17, so it's enough to allow for that chromium oxide formation on top. There is also a minimum amount of uh, manganese that despite the fact that that is just a trace amount because it is 0.26%, it is extremely important because it will form another phase with chromium that is electrical conductive and it will trap the chromium to avoid the chromium migration to the surface and the um, avoiding or better lowering the cattle poisoning. So what you're looking at in the, right here in this graph is uh, in your y-axis you have the area specific resistance and in the x-axis is the time of exposure. We exposed our sample for 500 hours and the temperature that we selected was a 700 Celsius degree. Uh, Decreasing the temperature of uh, 100 degrees will allow for the materials to work for a longer time. The current that was applied it was 0.5 ampere per square centimeters, which is the current that it was, will be actually used for the startup of the fuel cell uh, system. So here, with the empty square, what you're looking at is the distribution of the area-specific resistance. The area-specific resistance is a, a specific variable that is used to evaluate the electrical conductivity of the fuel cell assembly. Higher the area-specific resistance, worse will be the performance of your fuel cell. Uh, sorry, yes, correct. <laughs> Higher is the uh, specific resi area-specific resistance, ASR, lower will be the performance of your fuel cell. So you want to aim for something that uh, will stay closer to the x-axis. So as you can see, when you apply current, uh, somehow the electrical conductivity of the system, so is, uh, the area-specific resistance is increased, meaning that the electrical conductivity of the system is decreased, which is not something good. So, if we stick with just this result, this is actually not telling us much. So further analysis are needed to understand what is happening. 
So what we did was to bring our sample after exposure under the, the electronic microscope, trying to understand what things, what phases were forming and were responsible for this specific behavior. So what you're looking at here on top, you have the surfaces of the cathode on your left and on your anode on your right for the current and no current case. As you can see, just looking at the picture, even if you do not have any expertise in the area, if you compare current and no current pictures, you can see that they all look different. And when something looks different in morphology, most of the time has also some kind of different in composition. What you're looking at here in the bottom part, those are X-ray diffractograms. The X-ray will, uh, diffractometer will give you the possibility to identify what phases, in other words, what compounds we have on our surface. So we have identified this kind of compounds in here, listed in here. Each one has a specific symbol. One is a nickel iron oxide, which is a nickel iron spinel which is positive to have because it has a good electrical conductivity. Then we have an iron oxide. That's a something that is not too positive. Iron oxide has a conductivity that is lower than chromium oxide. Then we have uh, an iron nickel phase. Uh, that is still an open question. We don't know exactly what it does and it has been identified only for the anode with the current uh, exposure. And then we have identified austenite. With the star is nickel, which was expected because that's what we put on top of the material. Well, we have a good things and bad things in here happening. Positive thing is that we form this spinel that brings together the iron from the steel and the nickel from the coating that has a good electrical conductivity. But we also have formation of austenite. Austenite is a phase uh, of steel. But the problem with austenite is that the electrical conductivity of the material itself is lower than the, the ferritic steel. Yes? You run it at 700 C. You really, you're dealing with crap out of it. How does the austenite stay there? Is it just stubborn or something? It is stubborn, yes, it is stubborn. It stays, it stays there. The nickel uh, migration <coughs> from the coating to the, to the steel will push the austenite formation. So it's forming austenite? It is forming that. austenite, yes. Which is <laughs> negative because austenite has a much lower conductivity when compared to ferritic stainless steel and also the coefficient of thermal expansion is completely different so it doesn't talk anymore with the other ceramics components because we want something that when is brought to the high temperature must expand in the same way it's yes yeah it's due, it's due to the nickel, yeah, it's due to the nickel, to the nickel mi migration into the ferritic structure. That's what we think. The real reason behind the fact that austenite is formed is yet to be ident identified. But keeping into account all of the possible variables that are acting on the system, nickel migration, massive nickel migration into the ferritic system seems to be the, the answer that makes more sense. So after doing that on the surface, after analyzing the surface, uh, we sliced our sample and we prepared the cross sections and observed the distribution of the phases that we have identified within the cross sections. So if you start from the left in here, you have your AZ441, which is your steel, this is the cathode side, so where we have air exposure. And this is when current was applied, and this is when no current was applied. 
This is like the same kind of analysis that I show you in the very first slide, where you have a peaks, so you have a signal when you record something that corresponds to the element that is listed here on the right. And when that signal is low, means that you do not have that element. So if you compare current with no current, just looking at the distribution of those lines, you can see that the situation is completely different. So current actually has an effect on the phase formation of these specific materials. And this is something that it hasn't been taken into account. All of the research so far was just with a dual atmosphere environment and it was a specifically, um, specifically focused on the behavior of each single material. So the cathode, the, the, the ceramic materials, or the metallic material. So what you can see here is that when we have current, we are on the cathode side, we are forming on top a huge layer of iron oxide, which is not good. Iron oxide is not conductive, so essentially we're killing the performance of our fuel cell. Underneath the, the iron oxide layer, there is a steel layer of metallic nickel. If you move to the bulk of the sample, you will find that this structure, which is essentially iron oxide again, and then nickel. So you have a sort of a sandwich of nickel and iron oxide. And uh, then you have this uh, crack-like structure, and that crack-like structure corresponds to a mix of oxide, the chromium, and manganese. So when you do, if you perform the same exact experiment without the nickel oxide on top, you will find that your first layer will be exactly this mixed chromium oxide layer. That chromium manganese oxide layer offer a higher conductivity when compared to pure chromium oxide and also trap the chromium so that it won't pollute the cathode. Here, with the presence of the nickel, the chromium, oxi chromium manganese oxide is forming in the cracks and those cracks are most probably related to the thermal stresses of the ferrite to austenite formation. So essentially, it's not a good picture. If you check it with, uh, um, with the no current, what you will observe is that uh, you do have uh, your iron oxide on, on the surface. You still have uh, your iron oxide in here. So you have a sort of a similar sandwich formation with iron oxide and uh, nickel on the sides, but the distribution of the elements is different. If you check on the other side, on the anode side, the situation is quite different. What you expect is that you do not have oxide formation because you are exposing your material to a reducing environment. You have hydrogen on the anode side. So you should not have oxide. What you have on the surface when you have no current is nickel, pure nickel, which is expected. And that's just fine. Underneath the nickel, you have the chromium manganese oxide that was expected. If you check the sample when current is applied, the most external layer is no longer our nickel, but it's iron oxide again. And that's why our conductivity in the very first slide that I show you was killed because of the formation of this iron oxide. And then you will have your nickel layer that you can see here, and then your chromium manganese mixed oxide layer. So here are our conclusion. Is this the solution that we want? Sort of. 500 hours is a very short time, but what we have observed is that nickel may work, but is not the uh, optimized coating because nickel migrating into the steel will form austenite that will be responsible for crack formation due to the difference in thermal expansion. The very positive thing is that there is no chromium on the outer layer, meaning that the chromium will stay underneath and will not reach the cathode. 
But the other problem is related to the fact that, that the values of the electrical conductivity are decreased when nickel is there. So there are good things and the bad things going on. If this is the final answer, no, it's not. There is still some research needed for the optimization of this material. The other thing that I want to <coughs> share with you is a research uh, which instead is, uh, I apologize for this being uh, there and covering, but I don't know that that, that happened. So this is instead uh, uh, related to our negative side, so to the anode side of the fuel cell. Here, our um, harsh condition, our extreme environment, is mostly related to the fact that when you're building your physical stacks with all of the units, and when you use the interconnect that is made of steel, your ceramic material is brittle. So it may actually fail under the weight of the fuel cell, or the fuel cell stack itself. On top of that, you need to add the temperature and the gas, and the uh, gas effect. So what I was performing here is uh, understanding the mechanical properties of the anode material and how those can be improved. Previous research showed that uh, aluminum titanate, that is um, an oxide of aluminum and titanium, essentially you put together aluminum oxide and titanium oxide, has a beneficial effect on the anode fuel cell, on the anode of the fuel cell, because it increases the electrical conductivity and decreases all of those issues that are related to the long-term operation, like a phenomenon that is called nickel coarsening. So when you work with a fuel cell, what happens is that you submit your fuel cell to the dual atmosphere environment, but your initial material is in the oxidized state. You start putting there an oxide, a nickel oxide. Then you expose your nickel oxide to the hydrogen, and the hydrogen will be responsible for transforming the nickel oxide into metallic nickel. So you move from a ceramic material to what is called a cermat, ceramic and metal composite material. So since uh, aluminum titanate seems to be a, a good solution to help with the electrical performance of the anode, we started investigating the effect on the mechanical properties because one problem of this material is that they are ceramic and the layers are very thin, so they are brittle. And also they are porous material. And the brittleness of the ceramic materials increase with the porosity. So what we did here was to prepare samples, rectangular samples that were two millimeters thick and submit the, metal, the, the, the rectangular sample to three-point banding. If you're not familiar with what a three-point banding mechanical test is, essentially you uh, put your sample on the two supports and you load the sample in the middle until the sample will break. That number that you will read out of this testing is called modulus of raptor, MOR, or flexular strength. Essentially gives you uh, an evaluation of how strong the material is. We perform this kind of testing in the oxidized and the reduced state of the material. I know that there are a lot of numbers in here, but what I want to bring your attention on is that we are interested in the strength increase when we add ALT, aluminum titanate. We selected a specific amount from 1 to 10 percent, 1, 5, and 10 percent. And if you check on the strength increase, when you get to adding 55 percent of aluminum, I'm sorry, 10 percent of aluminum titanate, you have a 55 percent of strength increase in the material. So the question is, why is this happening? What is going on? All of the numbers that you can see here comes from a statistical evaluation. If you're not familiar with the failure of ceramic materials, uh, ceramic materials are brittle materials, and when it comes to evaluate the mechanical behavior of, of, uh, of brittle materials, you must conduct a statistical evaluation. 
The brittleness of, a of uh, ceramic materials is due to flaw distribution and the stresses that are concentrated around those flaws. So what happens is that the distribution of the flaws is completely random. So statistics will help us uh, to understand how the materials will fail. So a batch of 30 samples in the oxidized and reduced state were tested. And each sample was evaluated in terms of what is called the Weibull modulus, the Weibull distribution, and the strength. Per each sample, once that we had the Weibull distribution that I will show you in a minute, the effective volume has been calculated. So the effective volume is needed because the flaw distribution changes depending on the volume. So we scaled all of the, vol all of the samples to a specific volume that depends on the uh, statistical <coughs> failure of the sample itself. Using the effective volume, we scale all of the effective volume of all of the sample to be a one mil cubic millimeters. And basing on that effective volume, we calculated the scaled characteristic strength. In doing that, we have evaluated all of the sample in the same exact condition. And as you can see, the characteristical strength is the highest for 10% ALT. So if we base our evaluation of the material, this is extremely successful because we got to 55% more of the mechanical strength, adding 10% of aluminum titanate. At least that's what it looks like. However, if you look at this graph, these are the what are called the Weibull distribution. The slope of the lines that you can see here, those are called the Weibull coefficient. If you want a reliable material, or better, a material that has a low failure possibility, you want your slope to be high. You want your slope to be, to, sorry, you want your material to have the highest Weibull coefficient. Low Weibull coefficient will correspond to a brittle material that will fail very easily. If instead you want a reliable material, your flaw distribution is what matters. And your flaw distribution is represented here with all of the scattering of this point. So if we consider only the Weibull coefficient, uh, in other words, the slope of these lines, the best material for sure is the 10%, both in the oxidized and reduced samples, which will give us a 10.6 Weibull modulus here and a 6.8 Weibull modulus on the oxidized state. If instead you want something that is reliable that you can use in your system, you want to use a something where the scattering is minor. And in both cases, oxidized and reduced sample, that seems to be the 5%. My colleagues are taking care of the electrical conductivity and the performance of the fuel cell, and they also have found that an amount of ALT between 4 and 5% optimize the electrical properties. So it looks like that 5% is our magic number there. We still have an answer, an answer um, a question to be answered, which is, why is this happening? So we put our materials under the microscope once again. What you can see here uh, is uh, what happened when you break uh, the material. So this is the oxidized, where you have no porosity, and this is the reduced state, where the nickel oxide has been reduced to metallic nickel, and the porosity has formed. In both of these pictures, there is a feature that tells you that the material was, was mechanically strong. That feature is called the cleavage. What you can observe here, even if your eyes is not trained, you can see all of these uh, patches of material. That is your grain structure. What is responsible for the characteristics of the material. When you break a material through the grain and not around the grains, the factor is following a high energy path, path meaning that uh, the materials require high energy to be broken. So it's a much stronger material. 
Here you can see the grains uh, along uh, with the porosity and you can still recognize uh, that um, cleavage. So this is telling us, uh, yes, your material is uh, stronger and uh, your material has improved mechanical properties. Now let's see what happened on the surface. So we take a look at the surface and we try to understand uh, what is going on. This is the oxidized state and this is the reduced state. While you are manufacturing your material, you are exposing your material to high temperature so that the sintering process can happen. So essentially you mechanically mix all of the powder together and then all of those powder particles will merge to, see, to form a sintered unit. During the merging of those particles, a lot of diffusion processes happen depending on what is the composition, and those diffusions are responsible for specific phase formation. We notice that uh, this is a 1%, 5%, and 10% ALT, a new phase was forming between the grains. This is what we call a rough phase for the look that it has which is forming with increased amount of ALT sort of a framework around the grains. So essentially is like holding the grains together. When you reduce your material, your rough phase is still there. It doesn't change at all. So it looks like the reducing process doesn't have any effect on that specific phase. However, a second phase starts to appear which is almost not visible when you have 1%, but it starts to be visible when you have a 5% with this little thing. And it's really visible when you move to 10%. That is what we call a small particle phase. Now the next step is, okay, now we know that our material is stronger. We know that something else has formed. We need to identify what is forming. So we brought our material under an OG microprobe which is a specific uh, special microscope will give you the possibility to observe and understand what phases are in there. Um, this is just for trying to identify what phases are we looking at. It's not the best focus, but it was the best that we could have since we were looking for very high definition. So this is uh, the rough phase, the framework that I show you that is, doesn't change from the oxidized to the reduced stage. And this is the particle phase. We knew what we started with. We knew that we had a nickel oxide, so we look for nickel. We knew that they had an aluminum titanate, so we look for aluminum and titanium. So this, image, this instrumentation can give you the distribution of the elements considering three elements together. So in this picture right here, you're looking at nickel in blue, aluminum, and titanium. So you can see that the rough phase that is right here Um, that is form, well, it's not really visible, the red, but it's a framework that is formed in between the YZ, which is the yttrium stabilized zirconia, so the initial zirconium phase, and the titanium. What you can see in this part here, sorry, this one here is instead that the particle phase, which is this one here, is in blue, meaning that those particles are nickel nanoparticles. So what happened is that uh, while the material was uh, sintering, uh, a new phase uh, that is made of the nickel oxide and the aluminum oxide uh, coming from the uh, nickel aluminate was forming and it's called nickel aluminate and during the reduction process the nickel aluminate was uh, splitting into nickel and aluminum oxide. So essentially what we found is that the ALT doping, in addition to increasing the electrochemical performance of the cell, also increased the mechanical strength. When it comes to many factors, those layers, high efficiency of the cell can be maintained. Many factor is something that is very thin. So the thinner we go, the higher is the efficiency of the cell. If we have something, as you can imagine, if you go thinner, you also go weaker. 
But if we have something that we can add into the cell that will help the electrochemical performance and the mechanical properties, that will be a huge benefit. So we found that, that uh, the wireboard plot showed that the most reliable material was that the 5% uh, the, the dope ALT, that the uh, titanium of the aluminum titanate uh, preferentially um, reacts uh, with the YSE forming a framework that uh, keeps the grain together and gives a stronger structure, and that nickel aluminate form and nickel aluminate is responsible for the formation of nickel nanoparticles. We are now in the stage of understanding uh, what is the actual effect of those nickel nanoparticles because the result uh, is that the theory is that those nickel nanoparticles, the distribution of those nickel nanoparticles can be responsible for increasing the toughness of the material. So for adding some amount of ability to a brittle material to plastically deform but it has to be confirmed. And then more investigation is needed to uh, understand uh, how the porosity actually affects the whole failure of the material, which is going on right now. The very last thing that I want to show, to show you instead is not related to solid oxide fuel cell. It was a collaboration with NASA, and it's related to hot corrosion research and in particular for uh, propulsion. So hot corrosion, despite the word uh, hot, suggests uh, um, high temperature. <coughs> hot corrosion is not just related to uh, high temperature, but is related to harsh conditions that are created when salt with low melting temperature are deposited and form and deposited on the surface of our materials. So that normally happens in turbines, jet turbines engine. NASA is specifically interested in this area of the, uh, of the turbine, which is the turbine disk region. And uh, by 2025, they want to develop a material that will be able to resist at 800 and 15 degrees. Right now, they can resist to about 700 degrees, in particular 704 degrees. And materials are made out from powder metallurgy. So what's the challenge here? The challenge is related to the fact that our materials must resist to high temperature and harsh environment, but they also must resist to a huge number of cycles. So here fatigue, what is called materials fatigue, is a big concern. So a solution that NASA wants to adopt and have it working by 2025 is to make a hybrid disk. Essentially is to have the blade which are made out of a single crystal, the area that is called the, the rim that hosts the blades that is still made of the same single crystal and instead having a polycrystalline material for this area right here, which is the disc alloy. Now, with a single crystal, you may be able to solve the problem of the um, fatigue, or, or better, you can increase the fatigue uh, life and you can increase other issues like creep that are responsible for the failure of the material. However, that doesn't happen for the disc alloy. Manufacturing single crystal material for the disc is a challenge and is not possible. So NASA is extremely interested uh, in how we can improve the resistance to the hot corrosion of the disc alloy, which will be exposed to the same exact condition of this area right here. And that's where we started our research. So we started uh, hot corrosion, and the hot corrosion, one of the issues that I was telling you about is can they really decrease the fatigue life. In this graph you're here, you have the fatigue life at 700 degrees, which is the, temperature, the maximum temperature that is now rich at the disk. And this is the number of hours Shot pinning is a process that is performed on the material to decrease 
uh, or better, to increase the fatigue life and decrease the possibility of uh, crack propagation. Essentially, if you're not familiar with the process, what you do is uh, shooting little particles on the material, creating some kind of surface deformation. That surface deformation will create a condition in the material that uh, will allow for a slower crack propagation. It's not the final solution, but it helps. As you can see in the shot pin material, your um, lifetime increases, your fatigue life increases. But what I want to bring your attention is to these little rectangles that you can see here, the orange and the red one. That is how the fatigue life of the component is decreased after 8 hours and 24 hours of exposure to hot corrosion conditions. So that's a huge difference. A solution must be found to avoid the failure of these components. Previous research at NASA showed that in the disk alloy, the, the, the failure crack was initiated at a corrosion pit. So it looks like first the material has corroded and then the result of the corrosion and the stresses were responsible for the propagation and the failure of the material, the, the propagation of the crack and the uh, failure of the material. So what I did here was recreating that specific gas environment. And the specific gas environment of uh, hot corrosion involves the salt deposition and the sulfur. Most of the time, uh, the reaction happens between sodium chloride, which is in the environment, and the sulfur, which is in the fuel, and the result will be the formation of sodium sulfate. So I expose my material uh, to this specific environment where I have SO2 flowing with a, catal a catalyst that then transforms to SO3. On my material, I deposited a coating. As I was telling you before, manufacturing a bulk material with a specific composition for a purpose is much more expensive than using a coating on top of the material. The state-of-the-art research for coatings that are resistant to hot corrosion consider what are called the max phases. M is a uh, transition metal. A is a, a metal from the third or the fourth group of the periodic table. And the X is normally uh, nitrogen or carbon. The most commonly uh, used and the most successful materials are titanium aluminum carbide and the chromium aluminum carbide. However, despite the fact that the max phases are a very good answer to the hot corrosion problem, they are extremely expensive to produce because of the very uh, high temperature and uh, complicated complex uh, manufacturing process that is required. So what we did was uh, trying to create max phases on top of a nickel, just a pure nickel. Why is that? Currently, the disc alloy is a nickel superalloy. That nickel superalloy uh, is still sensitive to hot corrosion. If we can protect the nickel, which is much more delicate, we will be able to protect the superalloy. Chromium and aluminum, aluminum are the material that we selected to create our max phases. So we played around all of the possible binary and ternary combination of the, of the tree. So as you can see here in this picture, you can still see that with the chromium and aluminum carbide phase, our nickel, our sample, sorry, our nickel sample is still shiny and it's not oxidized. This is the pure nickel with no protection. It is completely black. When you see something that is dark, that doesn't offer good protection. Another phase that seemed to work pretty well was the chromium aluminum phase, just the binary chromium aluminum phase. As we did for our previous research, we tried to identify what was forming on those surfaces to see how successful the procedure was. So here we have all of the possible combination. We started with aluminum and carbon, chromium and carbon, chromium and aluminum, chromium, aluminum and carbon, binary and ternary combinations. We brought our material under the X, uh, XRD, the, the, the diffractometer, and we identified the before exposure, what phases we had there. 
What we found is that uh, when we were using aluminum and chromium, we had mixed aluminum and carbon phase, so aluminum carbide and chromium carbide, and still nickel from the substrate. When we were using chromium and aluminum, we had a large amount of series of species that add aluminum and chromium in different combinations. And for the chromium and aluminum carbide, we were able to manufacture our max phase the chromium aluminum carbide, which supposedly is the best one to protect the material. We are working with something extremely thin, just 1.5 microns, while in literature and previous research, max phases have been produced only in bulk. After exposure, meaning the picture that you have seen before, our dark samples corresponded to the formation of nickel oxide. When you have nickel oxide, your procedure was not successful. Nickel oxide is what you don't want to form. You are consuming the material that you are using as a substrate. So chromium carbide, carbon and chromium, aluminum were not, uh, sorry, nickel itself, chromium carbon and aluminum carbon were not successful. The one that still were shiny were the chromium aluminum and the chromium aluminum carbide. After exposure, we have been forming chromium oxide, aluminum oxide, and nickel oxide. Chromium oxide and aluminum oxide are beneficial. Nickel oxide is not. So we have been able, with the binary phase, we have been able to protect somehow the material, but the nickel has been oxidized anyway. If you look at the composition, instead of the chromium aluminum carbide that was uh, created before exposure, you have chromium oxide and aluminum oxide, which are beneficial and protective. And then we have the same phases that we found in chromium carbide before exposure, meaning that the material is still developing new phases that potentially can protect the material. And nickel, not nickel oxide, just nickel. And that comes from the fact that, that uh, the ray that we were using for our analysis went uh, through the layer and hit the substrate. But there is no nickel oxide, so we've been successful in protecting the material from very harsh conditions with just 1.5 microns of protection. In this graph that you can see here is essentially um, the way that the material was uh, gaining after exposure. If you have more oxide formation on the surface, your material is gaining more weight. So that is called what, um, that is uh, giving you another kind of information. What you can see here is the corrected weight because we, for technical reason, this, the samples were coded only on one side. So we have to correct, uh, keeping into, uh, taking into account what was on the other side. And as you can see here, the chromium aluminum carbide, which is this distribution right here with the blue dot, is the one that gained the lowest weight, which confirms our observation here with no nickel oxide formation that corresponds to the shiny sample. There is still a lot of work to do. Uh, NASA is really interested in this uh, kind of research, so I'm looking for possibilities to go ahead and try the right formulation, the optimized formulation, and the optimized thickness. The very good thing would be that it would be much, much cheaper to have this kind of coating on this material on nickel superalloy when compared to the possibility of producing completely new bulk materials. And that was the last slide. Do you have any question? All right, those questions for Dr. Mendela. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So in that the first study where you were uh, looking at the ferritic stainless steel, mm -hmm. so electro migration was an issue, you're saying, with chromium? Yes, the yes. Uh, did, did you do anything to prevent the electro migration of the gold in your electrodes? It doesn't really happen. Um, and, and then gold is not something that you will be using in your real conditions. It works for the experiment because it gives you the electrical contact, but 
we have never found gold anywhere in the sample. We had that issue when we tried to use the silver instead. Okay. Yes? You try either adding something or taking something away to get it so that you don't get this austenite. I don't understand how that's forming. It bothers me. Um, it's I, mean, if, I mean, if you get like, if it's an iron carbide diagram that everyone sees, if you're on this side, you got no carbon at all. Yes. There's, I mean, you get the delta phase that mm -hmm. you get an FCC thing, but. It doesn't bother just you. It bothers all of us, yeah. <laughs> actually. Um, that is a. We're still looking for the answer to that. Yes, I know. I know. However, the austenite is still forming. Unfortunately, we weren't able to understand to what depth the austenite is forming because we don't have the right equipment to do that. But it would be interesting to understand if it's related to the nickel migration within the, the steel, and so understanding if it's related to the distance from the surface, or if it is a something else. Because the, the migration, the nickel migration into the iron, and the iron outward migration, that is just, uh, um, just happened because we're exposing the material to 700 degrees. And it is very fast. It happens in the very first minute of exposure. So it's not something that we can control. But what I can tell you is that when we performed the same testing for 100 hours, austenite was not there. So it is something that is uh, temperature driven, but also time as a, some kind of effect. And it's, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell because there are a lot of different phases uh, forming at the same time. And so when we performed for 100 hours, we couldn't find austenite. And also, if you do not have the current into the system, austenite will not form. So a lot of variables are at play. Any other question? Yes. If you go back to the net, the, it's the corrosion. Yes. So on the ternary, um, material, you look at your mass gain, it looks like, is that something on the, the chromium aluminum carbide, is that, it's like you're about 10 days or so on this test, right, your time and hours? Yes. It, it, does it, would it ever like sell past it? It looks like it's almost reaching mass tilt that it might. I mean, it looks like, of course, nickel is just going to go on forever. Yes. It's, yeah. You, what's the longest that you've run these studies? We uh, ran for 250 hours because that was the longest time that we found in literature, so we can actually compare results. Uh, but we were thinking about uh, running for a longer time. One of the issues that we had uh, running the test for a longer time, so when you expose your test, uh, you spray your material with your corrosive salt to recreate uh, the, the exposure condition. After a while, it will get very challenging to understand what's the weight gain because of phases formation or what was left on the sample during the spraying process because you don't rewash the sample. Is that, that, that is not an accelerated aging study. These are more realistic to what they mm -hmm. were. Yeah. Could you do an accelerated aging study? Or with that, because I mean, if this is in turbine, 250 hours, I mean, is that it's, a, I'm wondering how, how long NASA wants these materials to last. They actually are conducting uh, experiments for a shorter time on hot corrosion. They just go up to 100 hours. Because hot corrosion triggers in the very first few hours before 48 hours. So if it doesn't trigger or if it doesn't get worse for a longer time, it means that you are not going to have an issue. So that's why they are conducting for a maximum of 100 hours. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm sure if you, have, if you have any questions, you want to contact her. She's easy to get hold of. Oh, yes. <laughs> Very easy. Thank you.